Ethan Marker. Greetings, horse enthusiasts across America and beyond around the world. Tonight, it's IHA Live, and we're welcoming Dr. Jennifer Zelligs and David Lichman talking about the book, Mindful Partners, The Zen Art and Science of Working with Animals. Quoting Jennifer, mindfulness is fully accept. Hey, David's got the book. Awesome. Mindfulness is fully accepting awareness of what is happening for yourself, your body, and the same for the animal's mind and body directed toward increasing wellness for you both. And then David says, what I love about Jennifer is her dedication to discovering the practical truths about animal training and her passion for sharing them. Tonight, we welcome Dr. Jennifer Zellig's PhD, author of Animal Training 101, who has over three decades of experience training dozens of species across a wide spectrum of training objectives, and five-star Pirelli Natural Horsemanship instructor, David Lichman. And the two of them were going to uh, uh, be featured tonight as we talk about Jennifer's latest book, which is a guide for us and our animals to be our best selves peacefully joyfully, creatively, mindfully, and together. So what does a mindfulness have to do with animal training? We're gonna answer that question tonight. We're gonna to take a transformative journey to a deeper level of connection and discover how to train animals through compassionate wisdom. It is my honor to welcome Dr. Jennifer Zellig and David Lichman. And the crowd goes wild. <laughs> <laughs> That was a nice introduction. Thank you. Awesome. So how are you both doing tonight? I give myself an A. Awesome. And Jennifer? I feel very well. I'm quite honored. Very happy to be here with both of you. Well, and I, it's a big honor for me. To because, all of you. Yeah, well, thank you. And, and to all, of, and that's to everybody here. Um, when it, David was my very first guest for my first um, teleconference that we were doing for Bay Area Savvy Players. And it's always an honor to have him. But throughout the time, and even at that very first event, when David was talking to us about animal training, you came up very much often as a huge influencer in um, David's progressions. And so it's going to be great to have the both of you guys together. So let's get started by Jennifer. Let's begin with telling us about your childhood journey. You wanted a horse, you loved animals, and you found yourself in animal training. Yeah, that's true. I was one of those, so my, maybe this story will sound familiar to other people on the call. You know, I, as a little kid, I was an animal-oriented kid. I didn't want dolls. I wanted stuffed animals, and little animal figurines, and this was young Jennifer. And what does a young person who wants to uh, be around animals do? A lot of times they start out horseback riding, maybe especially young women, I don't know, but um, horseback riding was, was what made sense. And so I think I started when I was um, eight or nine. And, uh, and I remember my, uh, the instructor who was teaching me to ride, you know, she gave me these kinds of compliments that were like, oh my gosh, you're a natural and you have such great balance, you know, all those things that you say to a little kid, but I really believed it. And so I thought, ah, oh, you know, this is it. I found my, my calling. And, uh, and then what happened was I was, um, I had a small allergy to horses, um, just a little sniffliness. I mean, not some big dramatic thing, but my mom was a um, immunologist. And that's the, you know, what they do is study the immune functions, um, both in terms of how that protects us and like, you know, that kind of stuff, good immune functions, development of vaccines, that sort of thing, but also problematic stuff like allergies. And so she had this idea that, you know, this exposure early in life would make, um, would, would make for a bad or a potentially bad development of my immune system. So uh, she forbid my horseback riding. 
And the rest is history <laughs> because <laughs> that was a huge conflict between her and I, at least as I uh, sort of vaguely remember. I, I don't really remember, but I must have been really unpleasant about it. And so she found me a course on animal training from the National Zoo in Washington, D.C., um, which was uh, at the forefront of animal training. This was over 40 years ago, 40 some, maybe close to 45 years ago. And uh, there were very few zoos that did uh, a lot of training with their animals at that time, even today in a lot of countries, there's still not very many, but um, it's much more common now. Anyways, I took a course on animal training as a result of a horse allergy gone awry. And I learned about um, training animals across the spectrum of animals from a woman called Casey Cover. Um, who uh, introduced me to some of the basics of uh, bridge and target training that we can talk about, or perhaps many of you know of. And um, from the, from the uh, first seven years of my career working with zoo animals, um, I got a really wide lens on the types of different um, beings that are out there. And that's taken me on my journey all along. And then some point I centered back around uh, to horses maybe 25 years ago. How long ago did we meet, David? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long time. So at some point I was giving a horse seminar with, with Casey and, uh, and David attended. And that's how we met. And then uh, from, day, from that, I think really horses have been in my life ever since. Um, again, so they came back. And by the way, the allergies... Not so much. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, that's great to hear. Well, Jennifer, before we go to the horses and, and your connection with David, take us through um, your education because you have a PhD. Uh, that plays a role in what you do. Why don't you take us from, I, I know that you were got animal training early on uh, there in Washington, D.C. How did you end up on your educational journey? Yeah, so I just, that was a springboard. I, I worked at the zoo with lions and tigers and bears, oh my, <laughs> um, literally the, 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 those animals as well as sea lions and, and deer and turkeys and a lot of different species, which was really um, a great uh, teaching tool. And I started working actually as a vet tech at that same time. So I, I, um, I started working with domestic animals and I worked with a dog trainer, so private, um, private dog uh, training consult, able dog training. Uh, and I started going to conferences. And when I went to conferences on animal training, um, national conferences in the United States, um, I, I, you know, I, basically became a, a kind of a member of the professional training community. And I had contacts that brought me out to California, um, to the University of California at Santa Cruz, who had, they had a department, um, a very special major called psychobiology. So it was a sort of a marriage of psychology and biology in which there was a, a heavy emphasis on ethology, neuroscience, cognitive sciences, but also the biological side. So it was a really good animal-oriented um, undergraduate emphasis. And while I was there, sorry? <laughs> Go banana slugs. Okay. Banana slugs, <laughs> yeah, that's our, that was our uh, mascot. Yes. That was probably the most important thing. Not that I've ever trained a banana slug, because that's <laughs> one of the animals I have not done, but I've seen many of them in the wild. <laughs> Anyhow, yes. um, to make a long story short, well, wait, you, you yeah, got to Santa long Cruz. Long, yeah, you got to Santa Cruz and you studied the psycho, uh, psychobiology. Psychobiology. And yeah. then really what happened was I... Um, I had a professional contact from one of the meetings I had gone to, um, an international marine animal trainers meeting. Uh, the, uh, the founder of the American Cetacean Society, whose name was Ken Norris, Dr. Ken Norris, uh, he was kind of the, um, I don't know, the, the, uh, he was in a way the patriarch of this uh, Marine Research Institute at UC Santa Cruz. And um, I got connected to him through someone else I knew. And he had, um, or his uh, lineage had a large uh, collection of, of animals, uh, marine animals um, that uh, were associated with 
investigations where the animals had to cooperate with people. Um, so it was a it, it was a natural for animal training, but they they had only graduate students. <laughs> and the graduate students didn't know a lot. They were sort of making it up as they went. And so um, uh, when I got in contact with them, they pretty much said, "Oh, great! Do you want to run the lab?" <laughs> I was 17 and I said, yes, sure. I will take care of, of that. It, it took about six months. I'm fast forwarding that, you know, but I, I, did, uh, I did take responsibility for kind of designing um, a program of care and training for a group of the university um, animals. And uh, there was a whole bunch of different investigations and different types of animals that were going on. But Basically, what ended up happening was that I needed to set up. It needed a, a village of of people to do that kind of work and to and to care for animals. One of the ethics that I got from Casey, or hopefully I also got from my parents and from the universe and from I don't know good works and past from lives. your village um, is is welfare of caring more about the welfare of the animals than um, the objective, the human objective. So there was a, a humongous importance to me in, um, in not just getting the work done, but in really connecting to the animals. And so I actually created a whole system of helping to teach the students who are caring for the animals and teach the, the veterinarians and the, um, and the researchers. And that just developed a, an entire collaborative framework that eventually took us out in the open ocean, got me on the Tonight Show with Jay Leno. And I think you know, but uh, the synthesis of all of that was that I, from, from decades of teaching um, students about animal training, I wrote a, a book and I developed coursework around animal training um, as a broad-based subject, um, integrating the sciences that I was getting from my education, which I got a PhD eventually along the way in this process as well, working with animals and then um, and then the art form that I learned from, from lots of people in lots of different aspects of the industry, the zoo industry and aquarium industry, but people like David, the horse industry, and people who work with dogs, um, people like Karen Pryor, um, and Bob Bailey, and lots and lots of other professionals that I, that I met along the way, and I kind of soaked up all this stuff that they that they had and I put it into a nice organized framework based on the science and my understanding and the usefulness of the different kinds of techniques and um, that's what brought me to Animal Training 101. That was a really long story. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> yeah, something I never asked you. What was your PhD thesis? At the risk of not being able to understand it. <laughs> wow, I you know what? That's so funny. Uh, the title of the thesis, what was it? Well, I don't remember the title, but it was about uh, the uh, a cooperative investigation to we worked with sea lions to to study their physiological responses to diving in unrestrained and voluntary cooperative efforts. So what we did was we we trained them um, a, the uh, a number of, uh, of different dive durations and to be able to recognize the duration. So one, two, three, and those were all minutes and it went up to nine minutes in duration. So we created cues that said nine minutes. That helped to uh, connect the animal's uh, physiology to the intellectual understanding of the dive duration and study metabolic rate and, and heart rate in a way that had never been done before. Oh. Um, with the animals free diving. Yeah, it was a, it was pretty cool. And that, that led to the open ocean work where we were studying whales um, using sea lions wearing video cameras. And that led to the Tonight Show the with Jay Leno. And, you put the yeah. GoPro on the, uh, on the yeah. sea lion? In those yeah, days, it so, wasn't a GoPro. It was a massive <laughs> yeah. camera. Oh. Yep, yep. No, that's great. So did, they, did the sea lions, uh, 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 so you gave them, you had a duration cue. Did they understand the cue or was it more of a, I mean, could they tell time or was it more of a, you should expect to be down for a while. And this one's a little longer than the previous one or do you know? One could not answer that question, except that we would, uh, what we did see was <clears throat> heart rate drops that 
were sooner in the dive associated with longer duration dives so that there was some kind of planning yeah they knew yeah, it's, it's, this one's this is going to be a long one i better be a I better long one, so we better go you know pull out all the stops Wow. Um, but what we did do to aid them in this is we, it wasn't like we went back and forth between one minute and nine minute duration. So if we were focusing on something, we tended to, to stay there. So yeah, the, the, it wasn't as much of a cognitive experiment where we could deduce this, the fine grain understanding of, uh, of yeah, I was just wondering if you knew it from the side effects and then What's sorry to monopolize here. What what's the longest duration that you have asked a sea lion to stay underwater? Um, nine minutes. Nine minutes. No, I mean in in your lifetime, you've done longer than nine minutes since. No, nine minutes is a lot. Okay. What what's the <laughs> nine minutes is a lot for a sea lion? <laughs> what's their capacity? Around that. <laughs> okay. Well, my question is depth. How far? What what kind of depth might a sea lion naturally go to? Um, in the wild, uh, the average depth. Gosh, you guys are asking me questions from from thirty years ago, and I can't say I really one hundred percent remember all this data. But in the wild, I think the average depth is something like two hundred feet, um, and the average duration is like is like two minutes. Because they're high speed predators, sea lions are not deep divers. That's like elephant seals um, are deep divers. So, so these are sort of rapid um, uh, fighter pilot type uh, animals. But this really seems, I, I want to redirect us maybe back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. David, I know we got all of that. Um, I'm well, the champion of that. Guys, um, you, so we talked about your education, you got the PhD and you were doing all the animal research. You found your way back into horses somehow. Uh, tell mm -hmm. us about how you met David and tell us about that meeting and what you found different about David. I was teaching a, uh, a workshop on horse training using positive reinforcement with horses, bridge and target training. And it was with my old mentor, Casey Cover, and she came out to California. Uh, we must have had something with the sea lions as well. But anyways, it was about, and another student of mine, Andrea McCann, and uh, David attended the workshop. And he yeah, I, met, I met Casey first. I met Casey <laughs> up here in Sacramento. And she was trying to find a way to make a living teaching people about, you know, <clears throat> the better way to train animals. And she discovered there was a lot of, there were a lot of people who were adopting pot-bellied pigs and and they were you know running amok and out of control and she was giving classes to people with pot-bellied pigs to help them find a better way to to connect with their animals and she wrote a manual about training using these uh, these concepts and then uh, so i was visiting with her on that and i you know i told her i was trying to do this thing with horses i i didn't know it at the time but i had discovered a, a bridge stimulus because I noticed that every time I would break a carrot in my mouth, the horses would all look, right? <laughs> so, so I then discovered that I could make that sound without the carrot. <laughs> it sounded exactly like the carrot breaking and they would look. And then of course I confused it with the recall cue and the bridge and the, <laughs> I, I was very confused, but I sort of, you know, got there. And, and then um, uh, Casey invited me to come down as a colleague to this horse and sea lion extravaganza where you know half the day was spent with jennifer and her sea lines and half the day out with the horses and then i started to get a much clearer picture of of what i had the little tiny pinhole peak that i had of what was available there and then you know sadly casey went back to the east coast and not sadly but i'm grateful <laughs> that i got to continue on with jennifer from that point forward and we ran several of those similar kinds of courses uh, modeled after that first one. Wonderful. Well, I still remember when you guys and, and some people on the call will remember when you guys created a video and Jennifer was playing with her sea lion and David was playing with his horses and it was set to the tune of anything you can do, I can do better. Tell us about that project. That was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely was. It's totally my fault. 
I, you know, I went down there. I had the, you know, the, it was such a great experience to be able to bring a horse to the sea lion facility, which later on got prohibited by uh, governmental re regulations. But m my horse, thirteen, he was such a trooper, and he went right in there with the sea lions in the in the compound. And we were just playing with all different things, seeing if we could mirror each other and do different stuff. And because we had been studying the Pirelli seven games, I asked Jennifer, could you, you know, show me the seven games with the sea lion, which didn't mean that she was going to play the seven games. She was going to simulate them. And so on the fly, off the cuff, with no preparation, she managed to cajole this sea lion into doing all seven games <laughs> and we filmed it. And she did that in a matter of about 45 minutes. And then um, I got to go home and, uh, and the, oh, then I said, well, what else can you do? And she did a bunch of other things, balancing the ball on the nose and doing all these poses and doing all this cool stuff. And um, so then I got to go home and spend three months trying to copy what she had done so that we could make this back and forth video. So uh, what she did in 45 minutes, I was sort of able to do in three months. <laughs> the most fun part of that for me was when a, uh, uh, because it was different for both of us is i got into the ocean down there i had to wait for these massive waves to settle down i would go into the ocean climb on the horse and ride you know ride out and then um, jennifer had i said can you ride the sea lion and she she hops on the back of the sea lion she said this is the first time and she targeted out in front of the nose to get her to swim forward and swimming around and that was that was one of the most fun parts of it, it was something we neither one of us had done no, I love and that it. was some great horse training, really. Well, and it became a memorable, uh, you know, a kind of an iconic video because uh, it really did show that um, animal training, you know, was connected. And and so ever since that time, I've connected you to um, one of the things I want to shift into the um, animal training theories is we have talked a lot about what we call negative reinforcement, which is the removal of something as a training aid. And David has talked to us about positive reinforcement, which is more reward-based. I'm giving you something for in return for you doing it. David calls it pain. Um, can you tell us the difference between the two? And also, Jennifer, uh, you've pointed out that there's, that there's six kind of categories. Can we talk about those? Definitely. Sure. Yeah. At its base, um, whenever you're trying to form behavior, you're doing some form of reinforcement. Reinforcement means behavioral frequency increasing. And there's kind of two fundamental polarities or mechanisms of doing of, of getting increased behavior. And that is th there are both um, ways of the animal getting something that it wants. Um, it either wants the relief from pressure or it wants um, something it desires. So these are, uh, this is an aversion um, motive or a, an attraction motive is a classic kind of way that that's described. So in negative reinforcement, you apply some form of pressure. Um, we, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't specify what level of pressure, but some, some form of pressure. Um, so that you motivate a behavior to occur. And then um, that behavior generally gets away from the, from the aversive pressure and it therefore it is reinforcing to the animal. It is negatively reinforcing. The other side is um, a payment is, is a good way of, uh, of thinking about positive reinforcement. It is payment. It is, um, and in fact, I use that word all the time. I don't know if that's where David got it from. Pay, <laughs> reinforce, reward. <laughs> um, uh, it is the delivery of something after a successful um, uh, iteration or piece of a, of a behavior, uh, something that the animal wants. So uh, most obviously, uh, food reinforcement um, is something you, you, know, you kind of recognize easily, but I want to say that positive reinforcement would, would be a big category involving all forms of things that the animal likes and also um, things that the animal learns to like that can be delivered as a consequence or is associated with the process of the achievement of the behavior. So examples would also include 
uh, petting, particular kinds of petting, rubbing, all the, you know, exciting, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, uh, uh, praise and um, uh, this, the, that kind of connection, that, that verbal connection that you can get a, a sense of satisfaction from when you have a deep commitment um, and connection between individuals that does generally have to be conditioned. So that's more of a sec, what's called a secondary reinforcer. Um, that is, it doesn't net, it's not in necessarily inherent. Although if your dog um, praise is a pretty basic uh, thing that they're looking for, because for some reason, well, for reasons of breeding, we have bred dogs to um, consider human beings inherently a positive reinforcer. So uh, a, a primary reinforcer, not even a secondary, just exist, poof, there you are. A dog is happy to see you if they haven't been abused by other humans. Um, a mir the miracle of you keeps on giving when you're a dog. Uh, so the, the, you know, that's actually why dog is man's best friend kind of thing. Other forms of, um, of reinforcement might be the opportunity to, uh, to go somewhere. Uh, to be with someone you like, to choose um, something you want to do. Uh, I mean, that really the possibilities are endless. The question is what to, what's in it for the animal, regardless, horse, dog, Jennifer, David, anyone. Human beings have very complex motivational systems, but that isn't to undermine the, um, the complexity that is potentially there for animals. And so, in the, in the broader scientific community, developing and cultivating motivators, learning itself, the occupation, the joy of enjoying the connection um, is, uh, is one of the things that um, comes from a lot of positive learning, positive reinforcement training, is you get eager learners, you get horses that wanna show up, right? David, David's horse is always, are coming right forward. And my horse, when I finally got one, that was the same thing. He'd come running across. Doesn't matter if he was in, in a field of other horses. There he was. I, I, I just, you know, before the, before this uh, uh, seminar, I just uh, reviewed the book now for the fourth time. But I, I came across the place where you talked about, it always amazed me that horse people talk about catching their horse. <laughs> and from a non-horse training perspective, I think, why? would you have to catch your horse why isn't your horse showing up and and it's absolutely true it, it's because we never made that a priority is that you know we want to have a relationship where the animal wants to be with us that's 90 percent of the deal after that it's you know there's some techniques and there's some timing and whatnot but if the animal wants to be with you and enjoys your company boy that's that's heavenly and the, in in traditionally you know you have to go catch your horse just even the words um uh, I think you said where you found them troublesome. Uh, the nice thing about Pat Pirelli is he, he always would talk about teach your horse to catch you. So he was thinking about that and, you know, in a different way, but the same, the same result, teach the horse to want to find you. Hmm. Well, yeah. and, and speaking of that, David, we, a lot of times talk about it's the release that teaches, which is really um, releasing from pressure, which is negative reinforcement. And I've noticed uh, in the three years that, you know, we, we've been doing the show and when you come on, you talk a lot about positive reinforcement. And um, I think it, it, how it, since this show is about the revolution in horsemanship and where we are in its impact on man, mankind following on Dr. Robert Miller's work, Let's talk about how the shift is coming uh, along. David, do you feel like you're at the bleeding edge? Do you think people are coming along? Uh, where are we on accepting positive reinforcement and maybe relying less on negative reinforcement? Yeah, well, you know, my approach is a, is a combination approach. And there's several reasons for that. Uh, not the least of which is that positive reinforcement by itself is not a is not a communication strategy. It's a motivational strategy. So um, we have to figure out some way to help the animal understand what it is we want. Negative reinforcement is the typical way that we've been doing it for hundreds of years. You put some pressure on, the animal moves away from the pressure and he sort of has a vague idea about where he wanted to go. <laughs> and, and, this, and it's not all that clear. 
but with positive reinforcement, there is a strategy called target training, which Jennifer can talk about, which gives the animal an exact perfect piece of information that says, this is where you need to be. And I believe in, in all training, more information is better. So in a, in a combination world, um, you, you could use the negative reinforcement as a communication strategy and then couple it with additional reinforcement from positive reinforcement, which is kind of what I've been doing. And then also I add in, there's lots of places where it makes much more sense to use a target to tell them exactly where to go than some vague information about go over there and I'll tell you when you're right. <clears throat> so, you know, there's lots of ways to incorporate these things together, but I, I discover that um, that there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of people interested in finding a, a kinder, gentler way to train animals. And they, they like this idea that they don't have to give up everything that they've done. They just need to find a way, they, if they find a way to do it more tactfully and softly, and then coupling it with this fabulous uh, relationship builder, uh, which Jennifer calls the relationship bank account, like building up this, this high value of you, <laughs> um, that people are looking for this. But it's, you know, we're, we're just, a, you know, I don't say we're at the bleeding edge, but we're, we're at the bottom of this, <laughs> of the pile. We're, you know, we're reaching, you know, a very small percentage of horse owners at, at this point. Yeah, well, um, before I get to my per personal experience with both of you, which I, I, I was going to jump into, but I want to go to, um, so Jennifer, you wrote, you wrote Animal Training 101, and the way I read your characterization was that it's really deep, almost encyclopedia-like, it gave you all kinds of doo doo doos, and it really became kind of something that's of use to a real professional animal trainer. And then um, through this evolution that that uh, is partly influenced by your um, uh, Buddhist or or you know mindset of um, uh, mindfulness and all that, that that you move toward this. Um, let's talk about the transition between Animal Training 101 and why you wrote Mindfulness. Oh, thanks. Yeah, and I'm realizing I didn't answer your question about what the six basic operant techniques were. Oh, yeah, please do. Yeah. I was, I was trying to push you away. I was trying to push you away from that because I looked at the clock. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is. It's a, that is a long subject. Um, well, I have two people managing the clock and they're on my case, so don't worry about the clock. <laughs> There, you, don't there know, are you don't know basic, how long that's going to take. <laughs> there are six basic operant techniques, and, and some of they're, they're very well categorized in here. They're also mentioned in Mindful Partners and explained in Mindful Partners um, as foundational tools of uh, building, um, building behavior. But yeah, AT101 is for, um, it, is, it certainly is for professionals, and I think professionals think of it. Um, or it's been called, uh, I'm happy to say that it's sort of the new Bible of animal training. Uh, I don't know if that's really appropriate. It doesn't advocate a particular technique. It is a, uh, it is a reference to all techniques that are out there. So whoever system um, who has picked and, and, and um, pulled from the different options that are available will all be sort of explained contextually from a pros and cons standpoint in AT101. But it is the kind of thing that um, an avid enthusiast, someone who really wants to know um, would want to study, but probably not the thing that, that um, is the place where you get started. And uh, maybe even what, it, what um, inspires, I think. This is, a, AT101 is a very head heavy book. And I, I had been told by a lot of my um, friends and colleagues and students that they, they, uh, you know, they wanted to hear the stories, uh, all the animal training stories, and they also wanted something that was maybe more. Um, well, what was what would it be if you were suggesting this is how to approach it? Because in AT one hundred and one, I I really try to be, um, you know, just a, a, as neutral and as informative as I could be. Um, without really particularly advocating, although you can you can understand where my particular enthusiasms are, but really just being more like a um, well a teacher. 
And in Mindful Partners, um, I think I give you uh, bedrock foundational techniques that are based on um, the deep um, contemplative traditions that have also behavior at their center. So mindfulness, my, so I got into mindful psychology um, it really in high school, but um, meditation and mindfulness, you know, kind of changed my whole outlook on uh, who I was and who others were and how I could um, interface with them with even more of my best self, you know, being more aware, being more kind, being more sensitive um, and being able to uh, bring uh, my best self forward at any given moment. And what I learned was, gosh, the heart of behavioral techniques, the heart of psychological techniques, they are the same. The, the deep principles are the same. And, and uh, the Buddha was talking about them a long time ago, but you don't need to know it from the Buddha. You can, you can hear it from a mindful psychologist or you can hear it from me. It's in the center of our animal training strategies. You know, we, we were just talking about wanting the animal to, um, to catch us. And that is um, a real sense of connection, which comes from generosity and compassion and, and interconnection of all beings, which is, is something that I think people who like animals, you know, really resonates with. So I wrote this book um, to explain some of what I think are the most important principal features for people who are looking for a way to connect with animals, um, what are the starting exercises they should use? Uh, what, how do they have to um, kind of orient themselves uh, um, in, in the interface so that they can appreciate what they're saying with their body, what their own mind is doing to the situation, and then how that might also be going on, what might also be going on with a clear view um, uh, for the animal so that you can take a, a new and sort of fresh what we say in the Zen tradition, beginner's mind um, to the whole subject so that you can really get a refreshed, luminous understanding of what's happening. And hopefully that kind of brings forward inspiration, brings the animal forward and you forward to your best self. So that's, that's why I wrote it. It's interesting that you mentioned that because um, Linda Prilly, uh, when I was studying with her back in 02, 2002, she would say, it's about the relationship. Always remember it's about the relationship. And what I discovered, um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, like Pat or Linda will say something and it takes you a while to really understand the depth of what that really means. But I want to compliment you because I've, I've been reading in your book and you really do go into uh, a, a real ex explanation that means something to me. And now I've got a deeper understanding about what it means to be about the relationship. I wanna talk about an experience that I had, and David, you'll have to correct me if I, I think it was, was it two summers ago and it was during the pandemic. And David called me and he said, hey, Andrew, um, Jennifer Zellig is putting on a mindfulness mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he said, why don't you sign up? And so we did. I didn't know, you know, I just thought, oh, hey, it's Jennifer, it's David, I'm, I'm in, you know, I'm always along for, with my buddy. And this was an amazing experience because we talked about um, getting ourselves uh, thinking about mindset and thinking about getting ourselves ready to come to the horse and then um, thinking about what our plan was with the horse. And when we came to the horse, to feel of the horse before we started to, you know, give them a set of directions and all that. What might the horse want to bring to this? And I happen to have um, a term we use, um, and a lot of people on the call understand it. It's from Linda Pirelli's uh, um, uh, uh, horse analogies. I have a left brain extrovert horse that's sunny and one of the characteristics of the left brain extrovert is that they're very affectionate and he really loves affection. And I noticed that now when I come to him and I get myself in this mood and, I, and I'm thinking about it, and it's becoming faster and faster and faster for me to get into that mindset. But I've been with this guy 
for se- we're in our 17th year together. And I can tell you just since the course, our relationship has taken off at another trajectory. And so I want to bring back to that class and the fact that David reminded me that, hey, that was the first implementation of actually applying the mindfulness book. And so that's where I got my early into this. Oh, by the way, David decided that he was going to train birds instead of horses because he makes his living at at horses. And I thought it was really interesting. I learned a lot from that. Let's talk about that experience between the two of you of the mindfulness course. I think the course came before the book, right? Did well. Well, it, it, I, I had the preview copy of the book. <laughs> yeah. The uh, the uh, the piece. Um, yeah. Um, so, what, what's interesting to me is that was that was a couple of years ago. This year, um, I have three horses. Most of the time, I spend with them. I'm working on cooperative behaviors with them. Uh, not, not cooperative, but uh, group behaviors. And I noticed that the littlest one, the youngest one, he was just opting out. And as I approached the um, a series of performances I had at the state fair, I, he was opting out more and more. <laughs> now, some of it I could attribute to the fact that the horse he has to sit next to, stand next to, work next to, is aggressive to him. And mm-hmm. I was not living up to my responsibility of keeping him safe. So part of it was that, but there was also a piece that just didn't feel right to me. So I said, instead of trying to fix this, I'm going to now spend time with him alone. When I realized as soon as I, I got that revelation about being mindful about what his needs were, that I can't remember the last time I spent time with him alone, unless it was training him for some medical procedure or something. There was not, no, no, just here's Leon and me time. So I spent two weeks. Uh, also, I was noticing the same thing with the little miniature horse too. So I spent two weeks. All I did was go out there for an hour or two and hang out with them. And I've got a piece of a, of my training program that I call bonding. It's a moment when the horse pushes his head into your um, belly button, and people have now they call it head to heart, which is a nice I, thing. But I but, time. but I I realized as I sat down there and I had done that with Leon that he wouldn't even let me touch his face. And I realized I've been missing all of these little, little signs and pieces. So I just tried to, to sit there and two weeks sit in a chair. I made a video of this because it, it was made, it was so meaningful and powerful to me that just, you know, of course I've been doing all these things. I understand all these techniques. I know how to, to, you know, to uh, motivate him, but I had missed the basic piece um, that's that's in this book, which is I was not really mindful of of him, and um, he I, he came to the place within just a few days, really. Although I continued for two weeks, where he was looking for me, I would sit in a chair, and he would come running out. He would put his head here. I could do it. I could call him over. I could move the chair. I could do all different things um, without asking him to do anything. Just enjoying each other's time, and the and the little one also. Um, I did it sitting in a chair, which was harder for the big horse. I did it because of the little horse. That's the way I could get down to his level without me to you know, break my back. But then when the big horse did it, it realized that was even harder for him to make this commitment to push into me and, and connect with me in, in a physical and an emotional way. So for me, the Mindful uh, Partners course and the book you know, that the, when we did that together, there was a piece of that talking about it. But this, this two years later, I finally, hey, you know what? I missed a piece of that with this horse. So that, that's what it meant to me is, uh, is the, the, the 101 book is, you know, has all the six techniques laid out and the benefits and drawbacks to each. And you can choose what you want to use um, based on, you know, these benefits and drawbacks and what your own personal preferences are. But in Mindful Partners, it's more about um, helping you to find the technique that is that your horse probably wants the most, <laughs> that's the most valuable to your horse. And that's, uh, that's a shift, I think, that's, that's welcome. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I want to talk about... Was with you, Andrew, yeah. I just wonder, because your story was very compelling 
do you think you were carrying so how do you see your evolution with your horse um which you said the relationship is really uh the the bank account has really gone up in the course of the the recent several years what do you think um what is it that you're doing differently well the the thing is is when i go back to the original when i got in into horses and the reason why i uh I was drawn to natural horsemanship from the beginning was because I wanted to have a relationship. And even though I come from a, a cow town and people have different approaches to, um, some people see them in a different role than I do, I always wanted to be my friend from the beginning. And unfortunately, um, my mother found a ad uh, shortly after I found natural horsemanship for David Lichman coming to Pleasanton. And I got an early on connection to David and we became friends. And so I've always, he's been influencing me. And then um, to study with Pat, I've studied with Linda. I've probably had influenced by 20 uh, different um, Pirelli instructors from around the world. And I've noticed a common theme that they all are passionate about their horses and they're looking for ways to, to improve the relationship. But it's been really thankful for me because I've been so close to David where we only live 90 minutes apart. He comes and stays here. We, we go to hockey games together. Um, but he's really given me an appreciation about the how to get there. And then, like I said, so it's been incremental over the 17 years and I've been working on Liberty. I love Liberty. He loves it because he's very playful. That's the, the left brain extrovert in him. He's a playful horse. He wants to move his feet. Um, but when, when I finally was able to connect this mindfulness and I'm, I'm doing some studies outside through, um, through a seminar where I'm learning about mindset and, and how we can show up and, and it's not necessarily, you know, it's not an animal training thing, but it really is because we're animals, but learning how to really become mindful of self. And so when I was able to connect that and, and what David's been teaching us over time and the and a lot of the natural horsemanship, uh, relationship-based horsemanship folks have said, when it showed up to your course, and I just, like I said, I came because David said, so let's do it. But, but I walked away with a whole deep um, and deeper process. And one of the things that's been amazing is that since this awareness has come to my mind uh, a lot due to that, I have noticed that the guests that we welcome on this show in the revolution of horsemanship, we bring on people and a lot of people are searching for the how, because how do you show up better for your horse? And what's amazing is that you've actually written it down and David's demonstrated that it works. And <laughs> I'm telling you that it, even though I'm not nearly the student that David is, but, you know, and, I, and I'm working through it and I, and yeah, you know, I have a lot of things on my plate, but but a, but a very important to me is that relationship with my horse. I'm telling you what, it it's making a huge difference, and that's why I was so excited about welcoming you both here tonight. Well, it sounds like a great journey. I guess it's a journey we're all on. Everybody all on. are. And so, so one of the things that came up in the book, Jennifer, was you were concerned, even despite the fact that even as a child, you got in early, you had a big head start on most trainers, you got the, the, the education, the PhD, you were young and you got into this, but you were concerned that if you spoke up, you were going to become a target. And I don't mean the target training. I mean, the negative, like you're going to be the target of other trainers, because as you said in the book, um, a lot of trainers, can get very judgmental about each other. Um, and you and I were talking as we were preparing that this judgmental thing goes on amongst animal trainer industry. And I said, um, Jennifer, that's exactly what's going on in the natural horsemanship movement because we've developed into a bunch of individual silo sects that are practically religions you know, I follow this religion and, and yours is not correct. And it's one of the things that I want to break through. I know Dr. Miller wants to break through it. He spoke about it even back in 2002. I got a sense when he said, hey, it doesn't matter 
who you're hearing it from, it matters that you're doing it. He covered it in his book, 70 different people that were doing it 15 years ago. Now we know a lot more people are doing it. And, and we, but we need to evolve and we need to knock down these barriers. And that's one of the things I'm really all about right now. And the fact that David and you are connecting um, the practical applied, you know, David's out there doing it and you are bringing the research side to it, the academic side. Um, tell me, um, how can we, in the revolution, and those of us that are equine advocates that are really trying to change the world, can you give us some guidance about how we can move this forward? Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, we're all, we're, we're all uh, doing our small part to contribute to, to um, enhanced welfare. I mean, I think David has really um, been remarkable. We discussed um, on the call before this, uh, before this Zoom, you know, I think about David that makes him just so exceptional and such a wonderful colleague is, is this, um, this idea of, of being interested in uh, new ways to, um, to approach things and to continue to learn from others, other types of trainers um, and, uh, and just adapt and evolve and explore without um, that sense of encampment and uh, suspicion and judgment um, that, that I think um, a lot of animal training is filled with. Um, there is a ubiquitous, well, there's a statement, I use it in my book. The only thing two trainers can agree on is what the third one is doing wrong. <laughs> that was a great line. That really and brings the point. That it does. And it's, it, I mean, it is real bad in the horse world, um, but you're not alone in this. This is, uh, this is part, partly, so one thing I think about this is that um, what, it, Animal training in general is, is one of the oldest professions, or you might even suggest it is kind of the oldest profession because when you think of agriculture and domestication of animals as one of those foundational things to human advancement, right? Mm -hmm. um, so horse training has been around a long time and that's good and bad, but, it, but from the negative side of it, it, it has a lot of entrenched ideas, but also for some reason, it's always been something that you only learn through mentorship um, and, and people have kind of um, jealously guarded their, uh, their secrets, their techniques, you know, so that they can inflate themselves. There's certainly something that's very um, financial about it. There's something maybe that's very uh, egotistical and personal about it. But um, it, it, the, the one place that, that I can uh, function in this is that going more in the direction of think of all the other disciplines you know, you know, what, what about nursing or, or medicine or, or, or um, astrophysics or, or carpentry or, you know, there's business, those business are real disciplines. Yeah, business there, is what I studied. Yes, you you take from a lot of theory to your practice. Well, where I was going with it was that um, those disciplines uh, are now in academic. It's not just that you're handed down, you know, your nursing method from someone who taught you. You you learn on the basis of what what the whole industry of, of healthcare knows and crossing over from the different disciplines in order to bring what are best practices forward. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a lot what I'm trying to do in this book, what I've tried to do my entire career because I, I happen to accidentally start out interfacing with lots of different species. And so from that kind of perspective, there's a synthesis that you can um, that you can see about where the best practices are, how people are connecting, how to solve different weird hard problems. You know that the aardvark trainer knows, but you don't know because he had his own, you know, um, or, or porcupines or dolphins or whatever. They had each of those systems had to work out some very tough problems, and actually the marine mammal field had to work out the problem that you couldn't force the animals. 
And that was actually why the revolution in bridge and target training occurred because you really can't push them around. Um, and because you couldn't push them around, new experimental methods were developed. And that actually um, did have its, its basis in behavioral science and it stayed there. So it collaborated with a lot of different groups, a lot of different species, and it, and it became a bigger um, group of, of knowledge or a bigger uh, well of knowledge. And what I think happened with horses is because you guys got such a head start compared to everybody else, or we, I shouldn't say you, I consider myself a horse trainer. Right. Um, we got such a head start. I mean, it's millennia of training with, with horses, but it's, it's a little bit entrenched because of that, because the tradition is so strong that, I mean, there, there's a beauty to that. And there's something that needs to be respected because there is some historical importances, but um, but there also is a, a resistance to change. So it, it's like mm -hmm. a, an, a very old culture or a very old, you know, held, long held view. It's harder to break apart. Um, and I think people feel safe in their camps. They feel like they want, they want to know, you know, and they don't want to feel like they have to go to college to know. Um, and, and so there is some resistance to it. Uh, plus, you know, Horses are very forgiving. It's a it's a workable system, um, and I think I think what helps is people like David. I think David is a revolutionary. Um, I'd like to count myself among his group, uh, trying to bring different techniques together for best outcomes. And remembering why we got into it, we got into it because these are beings that we're trying to connect to, that we love, and that we're interested in their welfare. They're not commodities. This isn't a bicycle or a motorcycle. This is a being. So that's yeah. absolutely <laughs> well put. Um, that, uh, from no, from my perspective, Andrew, the uh, you know how do we make a difference? I mean, this even just in this segment uh, in the horse industry, even in the segment of people who are trying to learn more and do more, there's still a tremendous amount of jealousy and. From my perspective, I always think that number one, I want to set a good example. So if nothing else, um, I'll 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 try to to demonstrate that that there's something here that's that's worth looking at, and that's you know a little bit of the wow factor. I like doing that. I like showing off anyway. So we get you know the horses doing things and people going wow. Then they tend to ask how. So I I always have that same mindset is, you know, when I see somebody, wow, I'll go and, I, you know, I wonder how they did that. You know, that's, you know, of course, I was drawn to Jennifer because the wow was so huge. And then I, when I started to learn the how, I really um, uh, appreciated and loved it. Now, sometimes you go and you see the how and you go, no, that's not for me. <laughs> that how I'm not interested in, even though it was wow, I'm not interested in that how. But we're having <laughs> trouble, you know, breaking down these barriers of jealousy and, uh, and tribalism, you know, not just in the horse world, but, you know, that we, we need to shout out, give a little shout out to Farah and the um, IHA, which is sponsoring this uh, seminar in that she's trying to uh, create an environment of non-denominational horsemanship. Mm -hmm. Like we don't care if you learn from Warwick Schiller or David Lichman or Pat Pirelli or Linda Pirelli or, or, um, uh, Clinton Anderson doesn't matter who you learn from. We want to embrace that the parts of the, all those people that are they're doing similar things. That there's a common area here that we should all agree on, and that's you know that that we should be thinking about relationship-based training and not uh, um, force, fear, and intimidation. So uh, I think you, you can't solve the world's problems this way. But if you if you if you shine a little bit that that and show people and demonstrate you know the, these qualities i think you will attract more like than uh, than than uh, people than naysayers no i really appreciate that um jennifer i want to make a shift over to something that you covered um which is judgment because we talked about judgmental of others but what about judgment of self all of us are going on a journey of learning and we all come from wherever it is and whatever our influences are. But how often do we get in our own way by being judgmental on ourselves? Let's you you raise the issue in the book. You talk about it. Let's talk about it here. Oh, what a good topic. Yeah. So this 
this is a lot what is in this book. It, the idea that, um, you know, uh, per, don't make perfection the enemy of the good. Um, and uh, yeah, it's speaking to this issue of um, harsh criticism of either others or self, um, it just is, is not a place from which um, any happiness, no happiness can come from resentment and anger. It, it just, it, those are um, antithetical. Well, th that's a Buddhist view, but it, it, try it out. You'll, you'll see the truth of it. Um, so for, if you want to be happy, be compassionate. If you want others to be happy, be compassionate. Um, that's the Dalai Lama. But the, the, the idea um, has to apply universally. So it has to apply to yourself. It has to apply to your students. It has to apply to your animals. And I think um, when I became, uh, or as I've, I, as I've worked towards becoming uh, a better teacher, a better manager, a better uh, trainer, it has been um, to consider the well-being of all the beings there and to start to, you know, to just start the whole process with the, the value of all those individuals, that nobody there is a commodity and everybody there has inherent value. And that's true whether you agree with their perspective or, or um, maybe, you know, you want to dialogue about it. But um, I, I think uh, we all, all of the top trainers make mistakes in every training session, you know? And, and I actually, you, if you listen to me on videos or you take one of my classes, you'll hear me go, oh, well, I probably shouldn't have done that there because there's this per percentage chance that that could have gone wrong. And, you know, at a certain point I learned that, that you had to sort of demystify everything for the students because they're struggling and they're trying. And look, we're all, we're all making mistakes. It, training is happening in real time and it's fast you know, super fast. And there's a lot of variables to consider in terms of what the implication of the animal's body work is, or, or, or maybe their past history. I mean, myself, I just get flooded with potential streams of information. And I may or may not be able to always react in, in, in the appropriate amount of time. And a lot of times when I detox, or when I de debrief from the session, I go, you know, I think that wasn't the right thing. I mean, I, I, I've been uh, been suffering from that for my whole career, and it, it's good where it helps you to um, advance for the next time. That's good. That's what we would call healthy shame, um, <laughs> in the sense that it that it um, that it brings you that it lifts you up, in the sense that it's dragging you down. Um, and that it's making you less enthusiastic and less, um, uh, you know, uh, able to um, to go forward with your goals. Then it's it's not worth it. It's not good, and it's not good either direction. Uh, there's a lot of people I think that have to start with it's okay. You learn from mistakes. That you know the the start is to um, this maybe the start of your training session dumping the garbage is to realize just. Um, try well for yourself and for your animal and then and then really rejoice in the fact that you're doing that that is something completely worth complimenting yourself about to to you know you can't control the outcome but you can control your intention you can't control how you bring yourself forward with it um and you'll just get there drop by drop that's uh, another one of my sayings in the book you know you'll keep accumulating a little bit more understanding of it every time and you're going to improve. And uh, if you're like me, you're going to continue to make mistakes for your whole career. So that's okay. That's <laughs> just that's just fine. Hey, David, do you want to comment on that? No, I mean, I mean, mistakes. That was amazing, but I want to. Yeah, hear it was really amazing. Mistakes, oh. you know. Um, you, you just uh, I'll put it sim more simply: don't beat yourself up with mistakes because we're all we're all tripping over our own shoelaces all the time. Um, it's interesting to me. I've got this coaching group with about uh, 50 people in it right now. And one of the, one of the more interesting things that I'm seeing is people beating themselves up for how long it's taking. And, and I mean, I'm only getting, you know, I haven't gotten this behavior that I'm seeking. And, um, and I look at it 
from a neutral position, I say, oh, my God, look how good you're doing. <laughs> Do you not remember what it was like three weeks ago? Oh, my God, this is fantastic. You're doing great. But people get caught up in the in the goal and not the the um, the, the process to get to the goal. I mean, the goal, it's fine to get to the goal and to have the goal. But the process of getting there, you, it, sometimes the incremental improvements are so small, you don't notice them. And that you need to give yourself a pat on the back when, you know, the horse does two strides instead of one. That's double. <laughs> you just doubled your, your progress. I mean, it, it doesn't seem like much. You only added one, but you doubled the total. So. That's my, my advice is to, is, you know, don't beat yourself up and look, look harder for the successes because they're there. Well, and that's one of the things that some of my favorite people that I keep being drawn back to in my, um, the, the David, I keep, I come back to you. I come back to Sandy Parker. I come back to Cezanne. I come back to Linda is that they're encouraging and they see they see the movement forward rather than um, what I'm not doing. And so I become motivated and I start to see the incrementals and, and it speaks to why we don't necessarily want to learn this just out of a book, just out of a video. We want to learn it from somebody who can help us coach through the progress, who can see the incremental and can help us when we get in our own way. It, would you agree with that? That's how I make my living. So yes, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You know, another word for encouragement: positive reinforcement. Positive reinforcement. <laughs> that those are the same term, and so it's just as good. It, so if you value it, there's you're not different than your horse. Your horse also values it. That's um, great. We so all true. value the sense of a celebration in in our, um, what, in our shining, in our, you know, every moment. So you can also take that right to the horse. Encourage yourself, wow, look at, I got that, you know. A, a gratitude exercise is, is a good one for, for people who are struggling with this. That's one of our mindfulness practices. Wake up and think of the things that, that went right. Just, just go for five or 10 things every morning um, that are going, going right or that you're glad about. And just let them land, you know, and do that also with the horse. Mm -hmm. Wow. Look at how still your feet are. That is amazing. You're so, so solid. You look at your head height or, you know, whatever it is. Look at your ears forward. Oh, what a nice knicker. You know, there's lots and lots of things. Oh, it's so kind that you've moved your hindquarters out of the way. That was so helpful. You know, just celebrating. That's great. It's great. And it changes our mindset from, oh, you got to do this a certain way and we got to get it to uh, being thankful for the journey, being thankful for the incremental improvement. And I think I think what I've really appreciated about um, what both of your work has been is that you've been articulating it. You've been writing down the steps. And one of the reasons I want to bring you tonight, because this this uh, this consciousness that I'm noticing and and maybe it's just coming from me, maybe there's something going on that the guests that we've been having have been talking about um, these kind of practices that we can actually do because most of the people on the call aren't here just for theory. We want to do practice. Shifting over, Dr. Miller talked about the revolution and he compared and contrasts several natural horsemanship clinicians and trainers. And as a large animal veterinarian and an influential journalist and author, he approved of natural horsemanship. And he talked about it being more than just making motions and wiggling ropes and just some kind of happenstance. And so in a way, having a large animal veterinarian who is, who is a well-known author in Western Horsemen validate the work that Pat and Linda were doing and, and others like uh, Tori Henry and before that the Dorrance's um, was, was, was important. It was important to have somebody come from the outside and said, I say, based on my learned experience that this is uh, valid. And would you agree that the natural horsemanship movement or the movement toward relationship-based would be better off if we continue to listen to the academic researchers like Dr. Zelligs, and we um, find more 
more open-minded people like David who want to learn from the academics and turn it into practice, do you think that we can continue this re revolution on beyond uh, as, as long as our lifetimes uh, go on? Was that a question to David? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a, well, there's a lot. There's a lot about. There's a lot about you know about the specifics of national horsemanship that are that are, uh, you know, that are leading that have led me towards find this finding this uh, um, adventure into more mindfulness. But the you know the specifics of it, I, I think we can all benefit from from the truth and the scientific truths that people are are studying are helpful and i know jennifer and i did a thing with karen roth who i see is on this call as well and we had an academic there and um and and so the, the more we can bring in people who are, are trying to figure this stuff out the more informed we'll be but the the choice to be mindful doesn't require any scientific knowledge it's a, mm. it's, a, it's a look inside so I, I see it as, as you know, the, the revolution in horsemanship, according to Dr. Mill, has, has brought us all to this place where we're trying to figure out ways to get a better relationship. And, um, and reaching out to the academics is a great way to find, you know, find out about positive reinforcement, which is not, you know, the number one uh, uh, technique. Uh, the, the, there's number one motivator in natural horsemanship. The number one motivator is pressure and release. So trying to find a way to... Can I be more mindful by taking all this stuff that is moving in that direction, but creating a relationship with a horse based on the way horses interact with each other? So it's 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 natural. We call it natural horsemanship. It's it's this this idea we're trying to get the the in harmony with the horse. We're trying. They call it uh, Tom Dorrance used to call it true unity. It's mm -hmm. like your thoughts become the horse's thoughts, and you, there's not a lot of poking and pushing. So they're they're seeking this kind of thing, and and I'm, you know, in my opinion, they're missing the positive reinforcement side. So any reaching out to people who are doing that and and is going to be um, uh, not in conflict with what they're doing, but only enhance it. So that's that's the way I see it. That it's going to grow. It's going to grow. Um, you know, Mustang Maddie is a huge uh, 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 practitioner i would say of these of this idea that we can we can be more mindful of what the horses need and, and still get stuff done you know we don't, there's, there's always that thing about oh my horse loves me but he doesn't do anything <laughs> or my horse does a lot but he doesn't like me there's, there's a middle ground here <laughs> and that's what that's what i think we need to be that's how we can push forward look into yourself find out you know how you can be more mindful of what they need. There's a great thing and right at the beginning of Jennifer's book, it says, you know, we want them to be mindful for us, but we better be mindful of what their needs are first. Mm -hmm. I love that, Jennifer. That was, uh, I'm telling you, this is this book's a page, a page turner for those of, once you have a mindset to show up, that your mindset is to be mindful and you show up and you start to read, it's a, it's a page turner. Um, one of the things that I wanted to bring up and I talked to Jennifer about it in the pre-call, was um, there is a criticism amongst uh, natural horsemanship, relationship-based horsemanship instructors that some things are tricks and other things are you know, taught by using the methods. Can Jennifer, can you talk, and then maybe David, you could follow in about um, this controversy of something called a trick. I'm not sure Jennifer's familiar with that. <laughs> it's, what well, in, in what what he's pointing to is the idea that well, that's not that's not horsemanship. That's just a trick. Yeah, well, and, we've and, heard that like, in many industries. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's what he's referring to. It's not so. on discipline, right? It's not yeah. about riding. It's not about things that matter. It's something silly. Is that yeah, right? and and that it's you're not communicating because it's just a trick. And I just don't see it that way. I disagree with that. And it was interesting because, you know, Pat Perley was a big, you know, he, he had, he was pretty hard on people, you know, that's just a trick. And, you know, you, you should be able to do the opposite of the trick. If you can't do the opposite of the trick, then you, then you've just trained this one, you know, 
automatic behavior and you, and you need to be able to communicate do it or don't do it or do it differently and the, like the, he was stressing trying to trying to get to the point where he wanted to have more communication but with the horse about what he's doing rather than you just trained this one thing i don't see it that way and um coincidentally at the last instructor meeting i was at he he put up all these five uh, categories of ways that we can influence the world of horses and and he listed trick training as one of them <laughs> And he said, oh. David Litchman is the best guy we have <laughs> in our organization to represent this. So I think he's softened on it. I don't think it's such a, I don't think it's such a, it just has that, that pejorative uh, tone to it anymore. But uh, basically the difference is, is uh, it's a trick. It's not communication, but the reality is that if you trained it, you communicated it. <laughs> it was communication, you know, how, how much you uh, rely on, on the training uh, and and how how limited your training is, maybe that's maybe that's a better criticism. Is that all he knows is these five tricks? Maybe that's not well rounded. Maybe you could spend more time teaching him how to you know take injections or you know how to safely load into a trailer and instead of you know that he can lift his foot up and put it on a pedestal or something. Maybe. What is the operational definition of a trick as opposed to? Yeah, that's the tricky part, right? So a trick is something, I get it. Um, yeah. Trick is something that he does, that someone doesn't value. A behavior that a horse does that someone no, considers it's, pejoratively. It, 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 <laughs> it's trained, it's, it's, it's a trained behavior that, that is trained in, in opposition to having good communication with the horse, well-rounded communication. That's that's the criticism. That's the difference. I don't see it. I see it. If you trained it, you communicated it, and you motivated it. Most of the world would say that about negative reinforcement. So that's kind of funny. Yes. Um, it's just force. <laughs> it's not communication. Yeah. Um, let's see. Well, Adam, so Adam it, made a, you know, uh, I just want to say oh, yeah. if the animal performs the behavior just from just from a completely outside objective standpoint, behavior is being performed on cue, an analysis of how the animal learned that behavior and, and valuing one method or another is, is back to the same kind of silly criticism. It's um, it's uh, yeah. And watch out because people who are in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Because force is one of the, um, well, it's a hammer, not a scalpel method, right? Um, so the, uh, so some people are saying on our, our chat that tricks, and this is how I've understood it too, tricks are for entertainment, um, which would, from my point of view, involve all of horseback riding. Uh, you know, that's, fundamentally, unless you're a policeman um, and you're doing work with the horses, this is um, for your entertainment. Um, maybe that's that's not the way you guys look at it, but it's, it's a leisure activity from my point of view. It's not like a, a welfare for the animal. It's not for research. It's not, um, you know, to protect mankind or, you know, it, so those, those entertainment is a very uh, sort of funny way of putting it. We, we say edutainment, there's a, there's an idea there, like, so is there a distinction between um, something that's just to make fun versus something that is, um, has a, has a meaning, has a value? What I've noticed is even, you know, traditional kind of show behaviors can be um, useful for a lot of different wholesome purposes. And actually I talk about this in the book, um, purposes like exercise for the animal, purposes like um, mental uh, stimulation mm -hmm. and the opportunity to learn something. My sea lions taught themselves to balance balls. I didn't think it was a good idea. I guess I thought it was a trick and it was a little, uh, you know, trick by the standard, like, ooh, I'm putting them in a pejorative category of, you know, circus animals or something like that. Um, and I've changed my mind about that a long time back because the animals enjoyed using their natural adaptations. And it gave me an opportunity to talk about their natural adaptations in the same way that I think horseback riding is, um, is, can be valuable as, a, as an exercise and an employment for the horse. It can be enjoyable for them if it's done correctly.
Yeah, I, I think the tricks are enriching, right? It, it would, it's a very high enrichment value for the animal. He's looking forward to it. Can I put my foot up here? Um, if it doesn't serve a practical purpose other than entertainment, I say entertainment has a huge purpose. And I, I've discovered that, you know, I went through this at one point when I, when one of my horses almost got injured because of a, a trick I was trying to teach him. And I thought, why am I putting through this? Why did I not, why did I not understand that this was a risky thing? Why, you know, just to make, just to go out and show off my own training abilities. Is that what I'm doing here? And I, I had to do a lot of self-searching on this. And what I discovered was that, that, um, um, that when you uh, provide something that is entertaining and joyful, you're spreading joy. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when you see, you know, my little horse doing some silly thing like sitting in a chair, people are smiling and they're laughing and they're getting all the endorphins and that, you know, this is, this is creating a, a, a ripple positive effect in the world that, that, that um, I decided not to be myself up over it because, you know, because something I did was maybe not smart, but the goal is, is huge. I find this that, that, um, you know, when you, when you can, when you elicit that, it's not about, it's not so much about me. I enjoy doing it, but it's, it's about, look at all these people having fun and laughing and cheering. This is their, you know, I've, I've given them a gift. My horse has given them a gift because of these, you know, silly tricks that they do. So I don't think they're silly. I think entertainment is, as a, is a very powerful gift. I, I think, um, <laughs> There, there are so many different ways, you know, from the animal's point of view, they don't have this, this lens. So I just want to you just full stop. And this is part of what's in this book is like, if you want a beginner's mind here, the, the horse doesn't see a difference between say, sitting in a chair and say, doing a pee off. Those are behaviors you're requesting from him for reasons known only to you. Um, now, the question of whether he wants to collaborate with you on it has to do with what's in it for the horse, you know, mm -hmm. how is that motivating to him, which is a big part of the subject of my work, you know, the clean view of things like that, going back to getting away from your um, anthropomorphic labels and just kind of getting back to the basics. And the basics are what comes before the behavior, which are your techniques they're your cue, which is a form of communication. There's the behavior itself, which is just after all a behavior. And then there's the consequence of the behavior, which is what happens as a result and, and what happens to um, hopefully to, uh, to reinforce the animal for, for doing that behavior. Um, and, and how overall beneficial that entire ABC element is, is what ends up being um, your relationship bank account. So the sum total of all of your positive interactions with the animal, things that the animal wants to see do see or have happen, their joy and their endorphins from the satisfaction of having accomplished something, which they, you know, an avid learner feels this way. Um, those things all sum total to your relationship. That's what how the animal views you is objectively your relationship. I mean, you, you've got your own piece of it, but but speaking in terms of motivation, how the animal views you, which is the sum total of the value of all of these things of, of um, what stimulates them. And they don't have the mind of, oh, well, that's a foot tapping behavior. So that's not um, that's not as good as a as a clean side uh, or whatever, you know, it, it, the uh, pick a pick a uh, pick a fancy horse term um, and, and insert it there. Uh, it won't make any more difference to your horse. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what I started out by saying is like the trick. The trick is, you know, it was it was trained and, and it was communicated and it was motivated. And, and the, you know, the the one tempe lead changes were communicated <laughs> and motivated that's why it's working it's that i don't see that there's a difference you, 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 the, i think the the distinction came from your horse only does tricks and he doesn't do any of any of the stuff that might be important to save his life he's in the little horse trailer why are you doing these silly behaviors i think mm -hmm. that's maybe where the distinction came from but the but when you see animals like jennifer's animals that not only do they show up, 
but they show up so enthusiastically. And I, and almost every time we've done a, a, a class together, she said, I'm going to do train a novel behavior, something that the animal doesn't know. And we're, and we're either, it's something we're working on, or I'll just start it from scratch right here and I'll show you the process. And, and what you see because of this in, incredible relationships you develop with these animals is the animals showing up, even though they don't know what they're supposed to do. They say, I'm game. <laughs> I'm ready to play. Try, help me figure out what it is you want. You want me up on that island? Okay, help me. Yeah, it's so it's this the the, the relation when you say it's about the relationship, you are you know you are such a huge positive example of that because your animals they show up with this idea that something good is about to happen. And I don't know what it is, and I'm trying to figure it out, and I may be struggling with it, and I may not get it today, but but I'm in. I'm a hundred percent in. I'm all in. I show up every day, unless I'm, you know, sick. Mm -hmm. And that's that's brilliant to watch. I've I've never seen more enthusiastic animals anywhere in any industry than than your sea lions, even the babies. Wonderful. Um, yeah, I think it was. Uh, I I saw. Uh, I think there was a post today where somebody put an interview of you, Jennifer, where you were talking about um, your diva. And then you were talking about your other sea lion who was more kind of. Oh, the, the difference between uh, uh, Safi and Beaver, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you recall it? Because that was really interesting. And I know we're really getting close. I knew we were going to hit right up against the edge. But spend a moment on this, because one of the things that you said that was really important was that the animal getting to play in this relationship and getting to, to is good for the animal. And that's a real, that, that's a big leap of faith, but it, but you're proving it um, uh, through your research. Uh, talk about that in, if you would. So back to the original um, description of, of what it is to be a reinforcement, it, 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 there are so many different motivators for an animal. And the best way to pump up your relationship bank account, which is, which is just you, it's the value of you and interacting with you. The best way to do that is to layer on as many interesting um interesting to that individual animal. And like you were pointing to, the animals have very different um, orientations around what they uh, value and what they um, enjoy doing and their kind of natural dispositions. That's not to say that we can't and shouldn't shove those a little bit one direction or another to balance the animal out. And it isn't also to box them in and suggest that they're um, whoever they start out being is who they're going to be, just like you and me and David and all of us, we, uh, we change and we develop new enthusiasms, hopefully, uh, throughout our life. So part of our job is to open that up as wide as possible. That becomes itself quite a, um, a stimulating process. It's sort of, it, uh, it becomes a snowball rolling downhill because once you start getting the satisfaction from the connection, once the animal's getting that satisfaction, getting their needs met, which are very particular to them as individuals, once you start making that connection, then um, every interaction you have is building that up um, and contributing more to it. And there's the whole stimulation feedback from, from that that's happening. So um, I think the start is the clean view of what's in it for that individual and even each day. So I think, Andrew, you said something like you kind of have learned a little bit to dump the garbage. You know, one of the things that uh, both of you have said is, is something about around the idea of an agenda, having a really big agenda going into your training session, like this has to happen. Uh, I'll only be OK if I succeed at this level. And these kinds of real ultimatum statements, well, they interfere with the Zen. You mm -hmm. can, uh, you know, if you have that, there, there's a saying, there's a, a people who have an attachment to preferences will have a great difficulty with the, with the path of Zen, because that, that is inherently kind of, you're going to run into problems. So what you need to be able to do is sort of flow with where the, who is there right now and what are their current needs and, and, and how can that match up? With, with what my goals are, maybe we can head in that direction or maybe we can even find something more enjoyable that will, that will support the greater, um, the greater path. 
sometimes uh, new things are found when you don't exactly get what you want, like penicillin. Oh, I love that. Um, Farah, do you want to come on? Because I always want to give Farah, you know, a chance. And she asked a great question early on. It just didn't. I saw that question. Yes. Yeah. I was, I was just staring at it just now. It. Yeah. Where, where is she? Farah, are you there? Hey, yeah, I'm here. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for your kind words. And David, you, you put it in the perfect perspective of what we're trying to do. I can't believe that. Uh, you both were able to show up tonight. This is huge. So I so appreciate it. Um, and I think you really do understand what we are trying to achieve with the IHA, which is really just a place for people to go, um, to have one resource, to find other great relationship-based trainers and instructors. And as I talked about in the little message there, that it's really about um, really not just about the animals and the people and the students, but the students and the instructors and instructors in the organization, like all those relationships are really important. And I love the way that you said that they, all those beings have value. And um, it just hurts my heart to think about how, um, you know, belittling students is still a valid form of teaching. And I just want to eradicate that because people are just as much motivated by positive reinforcement as animals are. And you made that perfectly clear in what you um, said tonight. So thank you, Jennifer, uh, very much for that. Thank you. I want to, I want to get to your question, Farah. Um, and, and I don't necessarily need to get to the actual answer to the question, but what you, uh, the, here's what you wrote. Uh, I like combination approach being most effective. I would like to understand more about exactly about negative and positive reinforcement. Maybe you can answer this question. Negative reinforcement often implies something bad. So I just sort of stop the question right there because um, it doesn't need to imply, imply something bad. There is something aversive or something that the animal doesn't like that you have to put into the equation, but the, it can be done tactfully and it can be done uh, with with uh, great mindfulness that helps the horse to find the answer faster than you would find it maybe another way. But um, the negative, the word negative, I think, gets confused. And I, I just wanted to clar clarify that. Negative means we're going to take away the thing he doesn't like. Now, we do have to put the thing he doesn't like in there. So that's where the controversy comes from. But if you start by saying that, you know, um, negative reinforcement often implies something bad, it's not. It shouldn't. There is a there is a piece of something um, that that uh, the animal may not like, but it doesn't have to be something he hates or is afraid of or scared of. It just can be something he would prefer not to have, and that's the way uh, a, a better way to look at it. Um, then your example uh, is if you crack the whip and ask the horse to come, they hear the noise and then they come. Therefore, you are moving the pressure. Is this still considered negative reinforcement? And there's there's a great big depends on that one. If the horse feels threatened by the whip that that the whip is going to touch him and he avoids the the being touched, that would be he would be negatively reinforced for coming without you having to actually go through and touch him. But my horses are trained to come uh, to the sound of the whip as a cue. <laughs> you know. They, they come to me because they, they like being with me. And that's just a reminder of where I am and how fast I want them to come. It's a, it's a, a more of an energy thing. But um, all, all of that, um, you can find the detailed information in Jennifer's book, which I don't have a copy of that one right here. <laughs> that's I apologize for bringing that up, but I thought maybe some other people might have that question about negative reinforcement because I know it is really commonly misunderstood, yeah. the, the terminology. But um, just to clarify, negative, it must be something that the horse doesn't necessarily like to be considered a negative reinforcement because in that instance like you're talking about when you crack the whip it's not the horses don't dislike the crack of the whip it's just used as uh, something to get their attention so it's not considered a negative reinforcement because the horses do they they don't they don't dislike it is that true oh yeah. jennifer's raising her hand <laughs> defer to the expert Something, something, there's no universal thing called the cracking of a whip that has one meaning to everyone. 
So something is what it is conditioned to, to be or how it's applying to the behavior, whether it applies in the front of the behavior or the, at, at the end of the behavior and the animal's view of it. So in David's case, he's got it as a as it's the in the front of the behavior. It's an antecedent, and it's caught, and it's it's a call. It literally is come here, um, and that that could be anything. You could you could make that a whistle. You could make that a crack. You could it could be anything. And and the way that that forms up is that the the horse gets rewarded when it comes in. So so um, generally that's a positive reinforcement uh, that's happening. If if that was created by somebody behind the horse or some, some, some uh, pressure behind the horse, pushing the horse in, then it would be a cue for, for, um, for it in that case. And the pressure, you know, it would depend on how aversive that was. But a, a cracking a whip doesn't, doesn't inherently have any particular value. It doesn't have any value in and of itself. It has a conditioned value that it has. Um, negative reinforcement does always involve some form of aversion. That is, that is what is being said in negative reinforcement. It means that the animal is motivated to get away from something. But what, uh, what David is pointing to is there's many, uh, there's many um, value or there's much uh, differences in, in how strong the aversive is. Um, there's, a, a, there's a whole continuum of salience, everything from nuclear war to a tap on the cheek. Um, right. And those that that is how big that spectrum is. So when David talks about tact, he's talking about maybe something I would describe often near to neutral, slightly aversive, you know, has the potential maybe to go up in aversion. But also there may be a positive draw. David is a positive draw. He has a positive bank account. Um, so him himself is a desirable stimulus. He walks up, his horses want to be there. So even if there is a negative stimulus behind them, there is a positive stimulus in front of them. So it becomes a very complex subject. It can't be one off with some sort of, sort of oversimplification. I went into a lot of detail there. Sorry. That's that actually was, wonderful. That was, that was That's perfect. That's wonderful, Jennifer. And I so appreciate that. And I won't harp on it too long because I know there's tons of detail in your book. But um, as far as using like a target to teach the horse to move forward from the stick or often with foals, I'll take the mom and use the mother as a target to teach the baby to move away from the stick. The, the foal is following the mother, but they're learning the cue from the, you know, the stick. So it's still considered a negative reinforcement, but there's a huge positive draw. And that's why um, when you were talking about using the combination David, I think it's so effective with the target training. So thank you, Jennifer, for taking that time to uh, clarify that. I sure appreciate it. And thank you, David. You're welcome. That's awesome. Um, let's see. There's one from Brenda here, which I thought was interesting. I have a horse who was trained by someone else to get a treat, begging by waving his leg and opening his mouth. And he has continued this to become like a stereotypical behavior. I'm, I'm not sure exactly sure what the question if there's a question in there but um i don't the, the my point in 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 picking out that question is um sometimes it doesn't matter you don't sometimes it doesn't matter like somebody taught the horse this you, you if you treat this as a behavior you don't want there's lots of ways to encourage him um not to do it in a positive way which jennifer will go can go into and in, you know differential reinforcement of another behavior or an incompatible behavior find ways to help the horse find what he really wants which is that you to stuff a treat in his mouth that uh, that doesn't involve any of this behavior um the uh and and you might consider that it's better that he wave his foot and open his mouth than grab the treat pouch from your pocket <laughs> Thank you. or or start to you know bite you and pull on you yeah there's a lot that it is better <laughs> well and that isn't to say that it has anything to do with the fact that it was trained by a positive reinforcement there's all kinds of adventitious behaviors that show up like running away for example or kicking you um, that show up from negative reinforcement. So, so I'll take any behavior that's been learned as part of an animal's repertoire and it's there. And so now the question is, what are you gonna do about it? Um, and if you don't want it, 
what David is saying is um, you, uh, you might train something that's um, incompatible, that's uh, a positive opposite. Uh, so he can't raise his foot up if he's putting his foot on something, for example. Mm. That's great. David, do you see any other questions you want to address? Well, I, I know Renata, she's, she's in, um, it's just an unfortunate statement. And maybe, maybe it's worth just uh, mentioning. Uh, she's in Australia. Uh, she's in Tasmania, actually. Um, I can't find it at the moment. Here it is. Oh, okay. I have traditional dressage trainers tell me that my horse is not interested if I am happy with my horse in the lesson and say their brains are only the size of a walnut. But I do know that they have a huge heart. I like to hear Jennifer's thoughts. I think, you know, this is, it's so prevalent, you know, just, you know, kick them, kick them, make them go, you know, go show him who's boss, get it done. He's not interested in your happiness and you shouldn't be interested in his. And that's a, that's a missile headed in the wrong direction, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, oh, so, you know, my 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 take on it is my take on it is encourage Renata not to go to those people, <laughs> to avoid yeah. those people. <laughs> but you know, but I think the the larger picture is you know maybe Jennifer can comment that that um, just to re reassure Renata that that's not the case. <laughs> that the, the whole point of this book is that that's not the case. <laughs> wow, I mean, uh, yeah, that that is rarely do you have something that is just straight up wrong but it's wrong in in every sense right they don't have the, a brain the size of a walnut there there is a skull of a juvenile horse back there his his uh brain is is um pretty sizable actually and he's not even full grown but it, it, i think that would would be also not a very valid uh estimation the question is how complex are um how sentient are they my my view is this is that um the complexity of their connections and the complexity of their potential behavioral um uh the things that they can do the, the things they can show you and um and what they can learn demonstrates them to be i mean they're long lived mammals with complex social interaction that can respond to very complicated environments and very uh, widely varied different behaviors. So by any uh, measure, objectively, you know it to be false. That, um, that, it, it, that sounds more like someone who's thinking about um, a motorcycle or something like that. This is a being. And it's, a, it's a, as far as beings go, and I've spoken to a lot of different kinds of species, horses are um, very, very uh, luminous, bright, interesting creatures that have um, a tremendous amount going on. And I think that's often masked because they, they also have it as prey animals, they have a lot of fear. And people misunderstand those that have fear as being ignorant. Um, although in reality, fear is a very smart evolutionary thing. Fear is there to to uh, to keep you safe. Um, it's you alive. You're old and fear. There's a piece in this book about the gift of fearlessness, mm -hmm. but helping these these fearful animals, it's a gift if you can help them to be less fearful. Oh, I love. I remember that. I love that. That was a great passage. Thank you for bringing that one up, David. Yeah. It. My wife and I talk about this when we are talking to uh, non-horse people, which a lot of times we're trying to influence local government or others to be careful how they might legislate. And so we offer the, our information about horses. And people are amazed when I say that I'm working on getting my horse calmer, smarter, and braver all the time. Uh, my wife and I see a helicopter landing we're riding toward it. We see a stimulus. Um, we're riding toward it. We see as an opportunity and we're giving our horses all kinds of love for being willing to be more brave. It is a totally different mindset than most people have when, oh, don't scare your horse. I'm like, no, I'm teaching my horse to be calmer, smarter, and braver. Yes, the gift of, of fearlessness, yeah. The gift of fearlessness is, is I, I think you well articulated 
is calmer, smarter, braver. And, and I really do encourage everybody on the call to read that in the book. It, it resonated for me uh, uh, because of my experience. I will tell you that, you know, as far as uh, teaching humans, calmer, smarter, and braver, um, there's a small conflict between um, smarter and braver, and you, <laughs> you need to listen to the one that's going to keep get you to survive. It's a fine line. <laughs> right. I'm going to be brave, and I'm going to get on this horse that's never been ridden, or I'm going to be smart, and I'm not going to get on him. So you need to <laughs> cho choose the path that, that will uh, provide for your, your own well-being, please. <laughs> Yeah. In mindfulness, we um, the uh, one of the better terms for fearlessness is it would be equanimous. So that might be um, equanimity. Being equanimous. Yeah, it's a word I don't know. Right. Um, I know we're all pulling out our so, uh, equanimity is um, is sort of a, an enlightened principle, but it is something where you have both wisdom and bravery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. And, it, and 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 it's a kind of steadiness um, that is very very deep and centered steadiness, so that it does take in this. Uh, I mean, I'm just. I'm just goofing off on the, the, the Buddhist reference here, but it, it, it is, that's kind of the ideal. Um, the ideal is both wisdom and um, composure. Oh, I love it. That's great. Do we have any other questions? Horses are very tolerant, forgiving. I, I think that many have learned disconnect from themselves and environment when they were used as machines. It's sad because they have so much heart to give when they feel listened to. And uh, thanks for a great evening. Do you have a website where people can ask you questions? Um, you can email me. Anyone can email me at any time. And I promise to answer. And I promise to have a correct answer. If you accept the fact that sometimes I don't know is also considered correct. <laughs> 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 but it's just my name david at davidlichman.com if you have horse questions or any kind of questions or even if it's just a question how do i get in touch with dr zelligs i can help you with that too <laughs> wonderful and then Aunt, you want to remind us it's animaltraining.us is that yeah. right Jennifer? yeah that's that's my website and you'll find uh connections to courses and audiobooks audio lecture series that might be helpful um Generally, uh, I will answer questions with my students. <laughs> so. with, without without yeah. exception, everything on that everything on that uh, website is is of high value. Um, if you find the Animal Training One Hundred and One book uh, to be a little intimidating and a little bit too much of a of a textbook, um, there's a DVD, and you can watch the DVD. And the, much of the information is in the DVD. So. I recommend if you get, don't get put off by the fact that it's like a textbook, just watch the DVD. It's it's fantastic. I think the yep. audio book is better myself. I, 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 I the audio book is a lecture series. So you can do thirty minute increments in the car. That's my favorite. Um, oh method. wow! There's all kinds of deliverables that you. I, I really have to admit, about. I haven't listened to the audio book, so I don't. And it's also <laughs> the audio book is material. brilliant. It's brilliant. Jennifer reads it with so much passion. That now when I'm reading the textbook, I can hear Jennifer's voice in my head. Oh, <laughs> I love absolutely it. love it. So she, uh, um, Ada had just commented that she keeps a copy of Animal Training 101 on the front seat of her car as a regular reference. Oh now she's God. a professional now. Uh, she's a twice, uh, she won two scholarships from Pirelli Foundation as she was making her way up. Uh, and um, She's going to make a big difference in the world as well. And I love the fact that this connection between Ada to Jennifer is, is existing already. And I'm glad that the two of you actually heard each other's voice. Well, they, uh, they, uh, we brought Ada down to, to, see, to meet Jennifer. Oh, you met. <laughs> but that was with uh, Stephanie. Jennifer was gone. Jennifer was gone. Oh, oh, it was with Stephanie. Stephanie's on the call. Yeah. Yes, yeah. she is. Thank you, Stephanie, for helping us with that. Wonderful. This is an inspiring conversation, everyone. And it's really kind of, uh, it gives me a huge amount of energy to see how much enthusiasm and knowledge and interest is out there. It's just, um, yeah, it's very reassuring, especially as I'm headed into my retirement years. So I'm glad that you all will take over and, 
and uh, do the work that needs to be done. <laughs> I'm not super retiring, but stepping back. So you, you'll be called emeritus and you'll still be going, we know. So I do mm -hmm. want to summarize. Um, first of all, I want to thank you both because recently Karen Rolf brought together four, two others and the two of you. And we, two of them were academics and two of them were practitioners, or three of them were practitioners because really that's where Karen Rolf is. And I had a ball there because all the time I knew that coming up, I was going to get to interview to you as the front, you know, front of this. And it's just been a phenomenal evening. I encourage everyone on the call to pick up the book. Those of you who have never had the opportunity to work with David, uh, it's davidlichman.com, or you can contact any from anyone from the International Horsemanship Association. Jennifer has her website, animaltraining.us, and um, her books uh, are available through that. They're also available on Amazon. But I want to summarize what's going on here in the moment, because when I bring, it seems when I bring David and another expert on, it just, it just goes on and we could go all night. But we're talking about the revolution in horsemanship, but Jennifer's working on the revolution in animal training. And it really does have implications for mankind. And that's, that's what we, we heard from Dr. Miller. But as practitioners, as academics, as um, recreational horse people, as equine advocates, it's, it's our responsibility to continue to learn and to help work together with us because it's going to be better for the horse, the people that love them and wellness for both. And so I thank you guys both tonight because you've made a contribution by being here, by, by seeing what you've said. But as we continue this revolution, I'm so happy that the IAJ exists. Thank you to Fair Green and all the people like Ada and, and Lisa and Jill Holmes for what you're doing. I thank the Pirelli Foundation for what they're doing. And David, of course, um, you've been a close friend and you continue to be, and I hope you will be for life. This is an amazing journey. And Jennifer, thank you so much for what you're bringing to the world. You really are making a contribution. Well, right back at you, Andrew, and the entire IHA. I mean, it's an inspiring, it's an inspiring group that's really trying to cross over those barriers. And I'm happy to be a part of it. I really am. Thank you, David. What you said uh, about you know about it being a, a not just about the horses and the horsemanship, and it's about you know the trying to create a better world in general, not just for horses but for animals. And and I just it just flashed in me. I think it was Gandhi maybe that said it that a uh, society shall be judged by the way it teach, treats its animals. I think I think we just need to look at that not only will it be judged by how it treats the same, but it will be improved if it does it with uh, mindfulness and heart. The society in general will be improved. Well, I love that. And on that note, I would like to wish everyone across America, everyone around the world, the people that are watching the tape, have a great time with your horse, have a great time with the humans and what you're learning, and may the horse be with you. Thank you, everybody. Hear the music. Thanks for all those kind comments, everyone. Really, thank you very much. And go well. Be well. Thank you. Who feel this way are links on the same chain.